variety in China's landscape, diversity of its people. Welcome to Travelogs Minority Series. You're traveling from Kusha to Kashka with me, Michelle Lin. In Xinjiang, you've already seen the lives of the local modern Uyghur minority. But where does local culture come from? What's influenced it? Let's go find out. Xinjiang is the largest province in China with a unique geographical condition and cultural heritage. South of the Tianshan Mountains in Xinjiang are numerous cities populated by Uyghur people. In ancient times, these cities were part of the Silk Road. At this time, the western end of Plessy Corridor was split into three. In this area, numerous kingdoms flourished. One of them was the Kingdom of Chuzi, known today as Kucha. Kucha is located in the south of Xinjiang, at the southern foot of the Tianshan Mountains. Kucha is a Uyghur word meaning communications hub. Located in Kucha is a grotto complex that is the oldest, largest, and most westerly in all of China the Kazil Thousand Buddha Caves. The murals that cover the walls of the caves have a definite Indian influence, seen in the clothes and mannerisms. Many of the murals are of a typically Gandharan style. That's a combination of the spirit of Indian Buddhism and ancient Greek art. There's considerable debate as to when precisely Buddhism was introduced into China, but most researchers believe it was around the first century that Buddhism reached Xinjiang and from there, spread to the rest of China. There's something typically ancient Greek in the long faces, high noses, ears, and dress robes in these murals. In its interpretation of Buddhist legends, Gandhara art incorporated many motives and techniques from the classical Roman art, including vine scrolls, cherubs bearing garlands, tritons, and centaurs. The basic symbolism, however, remained as Indian. These murals are breathtakingly beautiful. It's so amazing that it's about 2,000 years old. So it's that this part right here has been stolen by thieves. I hate when people do stuff like that. I mean, art's meant to be shared, you know? And like, I was told that these um, holes right here used to hold the statues in place. In the event of an earthquake or a natural disaster, they would be protected. It's, a, it's such a pity that you can't still see them now. Besides the themes of Buddha and Buddhist legend, there's a lot more to see here. Depictions of daily life, for example, mountains and rivers in the western region, animals, birds, and ancient architecture. You really get a sense of what life must have been like back then just by looking at these murals. If the murals are anything to go by, Songs and dances must have featured prominently in the daily life of the people of Chuzi. The famous Tang Dynasty monk, Xuanzang, is quoted as saying, Of all the places I've visited, none has music more developed than Chuzi. The story goes that once the Tang Emperor listened to Chuzi music for five days and nights, Chuzi music was in fact a big hit in the Tang Dynasty around the 7th century. The paintings are a reminder of the lost songs and dances of long ago. More than that, they are a key reference for rediscovering these lost arts. 
叫什么名字 ？Michelle。Michelle， 啊，挺好听的名字。啊，谢谢。I met up with two dancers, and they tell me that the traditional dances have been recreated by analyzing the paintings. They offer to show me some of their moves. The dance describes the story of the Asparas who flew down to Earth. As portrayed in the murals, the movements are graceful and fluid. What impresses me most of all is the amount of time, effort, and research that obviously went into recreating the dances of long ago. Pucha is a city with a long and culturally rich history, and while Uyghur people today live in a modern city, they still maintain some forms of their traditional lifestyle. For example, the headgear is still worn by the women and the dobas by the men. Another example is the use of donkey carts. It can be very unnerving to be stuck in what I can only call a donkey jam. The use of donkeys as a means of transport is so prevalent that Kucha is often referred to as the town on the back of the donkey. There are over 40,000 donkeys here, compared to the human population of 400,000. That's a one to ten ratio. It's no wonder they joke that there's enough donkeys in Kucha to carry everyone in the country. That's not to say that there aren't any cars, but really. What's the point of a petrol-guzzling machine when there's donkey power? The people of Kucha definitely know how to slow down and enjoy life as it comes. Besides the traditional means of transport, you'll also find that the Uyghur people still listen to traditional music. Such as the Twelve Mukan. In the mid 16th century, the imperial concubine Amani Sahan of the Kingdom of Yarkand decided to compose a piece of music in twelve cycles. They became the Twelve Mukan, which can be divided into three large sections, each containing 25 to 30 melodic sub branches. Mukam, as a combination of folk and dance, was made popular across the rest of China by the famous Mukam master Turdi Ahun and the musician Wang Tongshu. Nowadays, you can find copies of the Twelve Mukam in Uyghur, Chinese, Arabic, and even English. The wedding party has arrived. It's customary for the bride and groom to pass the lit fire together. The idea being, it symbolizes that later in life they'll be able to confront any difficulties they may encounter as a married couple. I've been to so many Uyghur homes, but we've yet to catch a wedding. We're so lucky to be able to have done that today. I'm gonna go congratulate the newlyweds. Oh. <laughs> Tony Aska, Mubarak Bosom. When the bridal party arrives at the groom's home, they find the doors are closed. The custom is to first ask the groom's parents politely to open the doors for the bride. This they do, although not before telling the bride that once inside their house, she must be respectful of the elders living there. Now, what the host is shouting is. The girls in the bazaar looks like gold. 
This said, she proclaims the couple well matched, since the bride is beautiful and the groom dashing. All this is said before the elders and friends are asked to wish them a good life together. While everyone else is dancing and generally making merry, the close female relatives and friends are busy arranging the wedding gifts that will help the couple prepare for their new life together. I figured I'd make myself useful and help out too. We stay only long enough to dance the mashala. Traditionally, Uyghur weddings are grand affairs, and the celebrations may last up to three days. To my mind, they deserve a good celebration after all the hard work they've put in, from the matchmaking and proposal to the negotiations on the betrothal gifts, the betrothal ceremony, and the religious ceremony, right up to the wedding itself. Located 20 kilometers northeast of Kucha County, at the foot of Tian Shan Mountain, are the ruins of an ancient temple called the Subash Buddhist Remains. It is divided into two sections, and it's still possible to see the rows of niches that once housed statues of the Buddha. Built in the middle of the 3rd century AD, the temple reached its peak during the 6th century AD when it was a meeting place, eminent monks. Over 1,200 years ago, 6,000 monks would gather weekly at the stupa to discuss and exchange Buddhist, Buddhist teachings. It's so surreal being here. You can almost still feel the spiritual aura that surrounds the place. There are many accounts revealing how important this site was to Buddhism. There is even a reference to it in Journey to the West. Archaeologists have unearthed scriptures here written in a unique script found nowhere else in the world. Amongst the findings were also scriptures written in the Chutsu language, proving that Chutsu was once a center of Buddhism. What's amazing to me is that I can still see the outlines of the monks' rooms and the temple structures. You really get a sense of past glory at this incredible place. From Kucha, we drive past the Tian Shan Mountains to Kashgar. The multicolored mountains along the way are surreal. They almost look like a painting. Kashgar was once an important stop on the Silk Road and a center of commerce. In the Uyghur language, the word Kashka means a place of many different residences. At the center of Kashka is Itka Mosque, the symbol of the city where everything here revolves around. Kashka is one of the most culturally rich cities in China. It's interesting to discover that here, speciality crafts are confined to different neighborhoods. Some are known for their ironwork, for instance, and others for their wood carving or pottery. Now, one such neighborhood is Kaziyabishi. Kaziyabishi is located in the southeastern part of Kashka's old city. The neighborhood dates back more than a thousand years. By the way, the name Kaziyabishi means pottery at the edge of a cliff. These days, however, there are few potters still left here. Most of the men folk have found jobs that take them away from home. 
still, it's a fascinating place to wander through. There are 40 narrow zigzagging streets where it's pretty easy to get lost. But what better way to meet the women and children who remain? Most of the women in this neighborhood make and sell traditional handicrafts such as the dopa, the traditional Uyghur hat. The neighborhood of Koziabishi has about 640 families. Some of these homes date back about 500 years, and most of these homes are involved in some form of handicraft or pottery. So you can buy like a local souvenir from here if you like. I'm going to try and get some. But before you even think of entering a home, take a careful look at the door. In the Koziabishi neighborhood, the main door is in two parts. If both parts are closed, it means there are no men at home and only female guests are allowed in. If one door is open, there is a man at home and all guests are welcome. And if both doors are open, the owners of the house already have guests, so you're more than welcome to join them. Don't be fooled by the modest exterior of these homes. Once inside, you'll see that the Uyghur people place far more emphasis on the interior of their homes. The window and pillars are intricately carved with traditional Muslim engravings. And it's obvious that the Uyghur people take great pride in their homes. I can't exactly see how many stories that is, but it looks like a lot. All right, let's go for a climb. Man, that felt like I was on the Stairmaster. Not good. <sighs> Apparently, Uyghur families, instead of building outwards because of the lack of space, they build upwards. That's pretty cool. Entire Uyghur families. <sighs> Gotta catch my breath. Entire Uyghur families live in this compound, and I mean, really, would you like to live with your in-laws? Who? I don't think I would. Next floor. You know what? I don't think I'm fat, right? But this opening is impossibly small. Look at that. I mean, how is somebody bigger than me supposed to fit through this? Either they're really small and skinny, or I'm just a little bit too big. Third floor, pretty cool. And already, the view is amazing. You should see it. Trees and buildings. The old city against the new city. I love, I love, 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 love the fact that there's a contrast. So beautiful. Finally reached the top. Yimi Naha and her family welcome me into their home and tell me that a few men here still keep the 500-year people still method of Uyghur pottery making alive. Like her son, Tuer son, he comes from the longest line of potters in the Kazuya Bishi neighborhood. He inherited the skills from his father, he got them from his father, and so on and so on, back through many generations. The traditional potter's wheel is powered by the foot, leaving both hands free to create beautiful weaker style pottery pieces. It must take years of practice, not to mention considerable skill to achieve that coordination. It's sort of like patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. Most of the pottery made here is practical, stuff like jugs, bowls, plates, and vases. If you come to Yimi Ni Han's home, you'll find that like any mother, she's proud of everything her son makes. In her case, it's to her son's pottery. For most Uyghurs, the handicrafts they make are a useful source of income. The streets of Kashgar are lined with great places to shop for a little something to take home or gifts for family and friends. What a fantastic chance to shop for some early Christmas presents. 
There are items ranging from dapas to pottery, iron, kitchenware, furniture, and traditional Uyghur instruments. These neat rows of shops are more than just a shopper's heaven. They're also perfect for just hanging out and watching the Uyghur craftsmen at work. And once you realize just how much dedication has gone into making the final product, somehow making your purchase becomes that little bit more special. The streets are filled with a symphony of the sounds from the craftsmen at work. Now, I've heard there's a place around the corner that specializes in making Uyghur instruments. I'm really curious. Look, they've made this out of blocks of wood that big. This is the traditional instrument that they've used. So that's the back, and this is the front. Let's play. I hear that the shop is nearby, so let's walk. And it makes it more convenient because I mean, there are no delivery charges, and yeah, it's just right next door. No one objects if you want to try playing the traditional instrument. But if you find them a little too complex, you can always strum the miniature versions instead. You may be surprised by who you meet here. I came across some Spanish tourists who were just as keen on the miniature instruments as I was. I happen to love visiting local markets, and I hear that if you're looking for a little bit of local Kashka flavor, there's nowhere finer. In the Central Asia International Grand Bazaar, my friend Melanor accompanies me to help score some bargains. If you're looking for material for that new silk shirt, this is just the place to come. But it's not just about the clothes. If you want to add a little Xinjiang to your home, there are plush carpets, beautiful vases, intricately decorated teapots, plates, and mirrors to browse over. The Uyghur people are exceptionally good businessmen. Perhaps this is a trait from the days of the Silk Road. Most of the businesses here, like the handicraft, are passed down from generation to generation. Don't be afraid to ask if you want to have a look at something. They're more than happy to show it to you. Rows of spices, preserved fruit, and nuts line the aisles. And the vendors yell out, offering passive five a taste of their produce. So when you have your fill, you may need to buy clothing of a larger size. I'm not quite sure if fur is my thing, but if it's yours, you know where to come. Oh, look at this. I think it's quite nice. I kind of want it. But... Don't forget your family and friends back home. There are local souvenirs ranging from handcrafted wood to replicas of the traditional instruments. And if there's space in your bag, why not pick up one or two of the cotton-filled sleeping mats used by the locals? But here's a word of advice: be sure you know exactly where the exits are before you run out of cash. Again, just yeah. We've traveled along the Silk Road from Kucha to Kashka, and even after 2,000 years, it's still a hub for traders. It's bustling and it's full of energy, movement, and life. It's an amazing journey. Well, you know what? I'm all shopped out at the Central Asia International Grand Bazaar. Oh my God, what a tongue twister! Anyway, thanks for watching Travelog. It's your turn to shop now. I'll see you later. This is Michelle Lean saying, "Hush, goodbye." episode of Travelog, we spend a night under the stars in the Alatai grasslands with the Kazakh people and wander through a ghost city in northern Xinjiang.